So one of the things, of course, that makes this book extra special for all of us uh, is that the story takes place here locally in our landscape. And in many ways, it you know, makes this story even an even more intimate one. Something that really struck me um, that uh, I thought about is, you know, although the, the story largely takes place in the mid to late 70s and the 80s, many of the descriptions of the landscape and the places are still, you know, they're all the same. So they're, they're very similar uh, to what we experience today. And, um, and that's not to say that things haven't changed in the local communities here, but I think it does really speak to the, the land conservation and the land use policies around in our region that have really helped um, to keep, you know, our, our area pretty rural um, relative to other parts of California. Conserving rural and wild places helps to conserve our pollinators. And as conveyed in the book, bees need wild places to be free and to thrive. Our preserved properties uh, offer places of refuge for people, wildlife, including pollinators, and some of the special pollinators that we have, um, that we are helping to protect include native bee species, the rare Smith's uh, blue butterfly at Martin Dunes, uh, and monarch butterflies that are so dependent on milkweed in our grasslands. Of course, there are many other uh, common pollinators, birds, moths, and other insects, which Big Star Land Trust has helped to conserve uh, with over 40,000 acres dedicated to conservation here in Monterey County. So when I first read the description of the location of grandpa's honeybees in Big Sur, the access of uh, Palo Colorado Road and Garapatas Creek, uh, I wonder if this was the mud property, uh, also known as Glen David Ranch. And a few days ago, I found out that it was, and I was just delighted. Uh, we still have hives out at the ranch today that are cared for by the Eichhorn family. And uh, I just wonder if these bees are perhaps descendants of uh, Franklin Pease's bees. And uh, I'll have to let the, aunt, the author, uh, Meredith, address that. So moving on to the reason why we are all here this evening, I'd like to introduce um, the author, um, Honey Bus, Meredith May. So um, Meredith is an award-winning journalist and uh, fifth generation beekeeper. Her memoir, The Honey Bus, uh, reveals the life lessons learned uh, in her grandfather's big Sur yard that rescued her from a difficult childhood. The, bu uh, the book has been published in 18 countries and translated into 11 languages. Her 2017 book, I Who Did Not Die, tells a true story of an Iranian child soldier who risked his life to save an enemy during the Iran-Iraq War, an astonishing act of bravery and kindness that changed the course of both of their lives. During her 16 year career at the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, Meredith's reporting won the Penn USA Literary Award for journalism, the Casey Medal for meritorious journalism, and first place feature writing awards from the Society of Professional Journalists and the Associated Press. Her series about an Iraqi boy wounded during the Second Gulf War was shortlisted for the Pulitzer Prize. Meredith is a former professor of journalism and podcasting at Mills College in Oakland, California. She moved back to Carmel Valley about a year ago and spends her time writing, beekeeping, and volunteering for our beloved Monterey Bay Aquarium as a scuba diver. Thank you, Meredith, for joining us tonight and uh, please take it away. Oh, Jeanette, thank you so much. Um, the answer to your question is yes, those are descendants of my grandfather's bees. His spirit is definitely alive and buzzing around. And I have a quick funny story. Um, Peter Eichhorn, uh, who is managing those bees now, he inherited uh, them from my grandfather. And a couple of years ago, when we had a lot of rain, uh, the creek down there shifted course and cut off the bee yard from the land. So I uh, went down with Peter and Peter's son, Ben, and uh, Ben's at the time fiance, we put on bee suits and rain boots and trudged up there uh, to get the bees and we had to carry them in our hands through the river. And we got started a little too late and we lost the light. So we were, it was the most ridiculous thing carrying like 50,000 bees in a box in the dark through the river and then up the steep slope, but we somehow got them all out and put them at uh, Peter Eichhorn's yard. So. It looked like a scene out of Breaking Bad. It was really <laughs> crazy, but we got it done. Um, and some of the photos that are in the book of um, the road 
to grandpa's bee yard were taken during that trip. Um, so, and I'll get to that. Um, as you said, I put together a slideshow so I can um, give you guys a real good sense of what it looked like and felt like. Um, so it's incredibly special to be here today with the Big Sur Land Trust because, you know, my grandfather Franklin Peace was a really big fan. Um, he liked to joke that you guys grandfathered him in when um, you took over the land there because you let him keep beekeeping in Garapata Canyon. So um, he was uh, always spoke highly of the land trust and I'm sure there are um, a lot of people signed in today who might have known him personally. And, you know, never in my wildest dreams did I think that this book would do what it did and, and touch so many people and be published in around the world. Um, you know, I thought it was an odd little story about um, how a lonely kid learns about life and big from her grandfather and his bees in Big Sur. But, you know, I wasn't quite sure people were going to relate or get it. But, you know, after listening, Jeanette, to your introduction, people are completely getting what this book is about. And it's um, amazing. The book came out in 2019 in April and the book tour is still going. I mean, thanks to Zoom, it's still going. And I really love this format. I love that um, I can talk to so many people at once. And sometimes I think it's a little more comfortable for people to ask questions in a chat rather than to raise their hand in a crowd. And I've found that um, the conversations are actually kind of deeper than at a conference or a bookstore or what have you. So um, thank you uh, for championing my book. And um, thank you, everybody. I see there's 120 people on right now. That's amazing. Thank you for arranging your schedules to be here with us today. And, um, you know, Grandpa would have been tickled to see this. Um, he would have been completely astonished by the technology. He never owned a computer or a cell phone in his entire life. And if I tried to explain this all to him, he would sort of get it, but he would just be happy that this many people wanted to um, be with him. So what I'd like to do in the time I have with you is put 2020 on pause. I want to take you back to the 70s. I want to take you back to Big Sur and Carmel Valley and give you a VIP tour inside Grandpa's Honey Bus. Um, so I'll get the slideshow going and um, hopefully it'll, it'll bring you a deeper sense of the story in my book and also just show you visually how special it was to be raised by the beekeeper of Big Sur. So if you'll bear with me, I will hopefully press the right buttons in the right sequence so that this just goes smoothly. And um, so just hum some music to yourself and we'll get this going here. All right, so I was driven to write this book because like all of you, I have a soundtrack of memories and emotions that plays on loop in my head. And for some of you, this is a pleasant experience, <laughs> but for me, as I got older, if I didn't write this story down, it was going to turn into an earworm from hell that <laughs> was going to devour me from within. So writing is therapy and it's, you know, Flannery O'Connor had a great quote that I, I absolutely love. It's, she says, I write to discover what I know. So that was sort of the, the reason for um, engaging in this. Uh, it took me 10 years because at first, uh, it was a really wounded story and very self-indulgent until I started really thinking about it and understanding that my glass was not half full. In fact, it was more than full. Um, so the story comes out because it can't not come out. And when I'm writing it, it feels like a delirium. And then it's the readers who read it and then contact me and, and write, a, tell me what my bo own book is about. And that's how I understand what the themes are. So by now I get it. <laughs> like I could, when it first came out, I still couldn't quite describe my book. But because of that feedback loop, I now know that the Honey Bus is about the special bond between uh, little girls and grandpas. It's about the ancient wisdom of bees. It's about losing a mother to mental illness. And it's a love letter to 70s California, when we were all drinking tab and driving gremlins and listening to the Bee Gees on 8-track. And we all did it, it's okay. We're in a safe space, we can admit this. So the story starts when I'm five, and like a lot of kids in the 70s, my parents split up. 
Only in this case, it sent my mother tumbling into a downward spiral from which she never returned. And my brother, Matthew, was three when this happened. We were living in Rhode Island at the time in Newport in this duplex, and we lived on the left-hand side, and my father was in the Navy. My parents met while registering for classes at M Monterey Peninsula College, MPC, but then my dad was stationed at Newport, so that's why we were there. Um, I remember a big fight in the kitchen and dishware was thrown. And not long after, I found myself on a plane with my mother and my brother. And when the plane landed, we were in California. And the three of us moved into my mother's childhood bedroom in my grandparents' tiny house in Carmel Valley. I shared a bed with my mother and my brother had a cot at the foot of our bed. And that was our living arrangement for the next decade. As my mother slipped into a marathon melancholy and retreated to bed and never mentioned my father again. And this photo cracks me up because my father looks like he does not know what to do with a baby. He looks so petrified there. And he looks like he's holding a, a chicken instead of a baby, you know, but he's, he's 24, 25 there. So I think I would be scared too. So my grandmother became absorbed in my mother's problems. So my brother and I, we gravitated toward my grandfather. He was an eccentric mountain man who had more than a hundred beehives tucked into the remote canyons along the Big Sur coast. He was also a plumber, and this was just one of his many piles of spare equipment of stuff that might come in handy someday. And that's a stray cat that Grandpa had this uh, ability to draw orphans to him. Uh, we never got new stuff very often. And when we did, it was precious. And this is a wheelbarrow he got for Christmas or something. And he didn't want to scratch it. So he left it in the living room for a while. And then he started sitting in it and watching his Jacques Cousteau programs at night. So there he is enjoying his television with a glass of champagne. <laughs> And um, every spring, we had um, this red rotary phone in the kitchen, and it would ring and ring and ring in the spring with people calling that they had honeybee swarms on their properties. And so Grandpa and I would hop in the truck and race out there to go get them. And this is um, a swarm, I think, that he picked up in uh, PG. And this is probably familiar to almost everybody um, on the Zoom, but the, pretend... When I'm not speaking to locals, I say, you know, this is the Coast Highway 1. Um, this is the road that we uh, would take to get to his bee yards. And then we'd get to Palo Colorado Canyon and make a left turn and go through the eucalyptus groves and the redwood forests. And then all the way up to what is Glen Devon now, and then the road would become uh, dirt and uh, had really tight switchbacks. You had to honk when you're coming around the corner because someone else might be coming the other way. And you had to have a chainsaw in the back of your truck in case there was a tree or something that fell across the road and definitely four wheel drive. Um, we got, even so we got pulled out a few times by the trotters because we got stuck, but it was very precarious, but I loved it. Uh, we had to drive through creeks and so on and so forth. So this slide kind of gives you an idea of how remote, um, the B yard was. I put a pin in there to show you his um, apiary was in the Gape, sorry, Garapata Canyon. And um, you can see Highway 1 on the left side. And the reason he wanted his B yards in an inaccessible place was for a, a bunch of reasons. Um, one, they're away from people. Um, two, the mountains provided a wind buffer. There's a water source with the creek. And also the um, area was covered in coastal sage. So really all the bees had to do was come out of the hive, fly to the top of the ridge and feast on honey and their belly is getting heavier and heavier and heavier. They would just float back down and land on their landing board again. So they really didn't have to work at it. And um, he wanted sage honey because, you know, among honey aficionados, um, there are a few kinds of honey that are really prized. Um, because they don't crystallize and uh, they're delicious. And one is sage and one is Tupelo honey from the bayou. 
and the other one is uh, Manuka from New Zealand, um, and that one's super medicinal as well. It's another reason, but he wanted pure sage um, honey. So in the 70s, Grandpa would bring me here. This is his bee yard in Garapata, and he would apprentice me. So he was apprenticing me in beekeeping, but he was being very sly about it, and he was giving me little lessons about life by telling me stories about how bees solve problems. I didn't realize this until I was older and started beekeeping in 2011 as an adult. And I would re remember a lot of the things he had told me about bees, but then I thought, wait a minute, he wasn't just talking to me about bees. He was talking to me about, you know, uh, loyalty and whatnot. So that's what became the messages in the book. Um, so here he is in our backyard in Carmel Valley. And what do you notice about his outfit? Yeah, everyone's like, Ugh. Right, no gloves. Um, in fact, the only protection he ever used was that veil. Um, he subscribed to the old beekeeper's tale that venom prevents arthritis and he never got it, so who knows? And my grandmother did and she never went near the beehives. So that was his scientific proof. Um, but actually uh, the good thing about, a lot of beekeepers don't wear gloves, um, I do, but it's a lot of beekeepers say, and I believe this is true, that if you don't wear gloves, it, it, it uh, forces you to be more gentle when you're beekeeping, but also you get a better sense of the mood of the bees by their vibration. You can feel if they're frenetic or if they're calm, if you're in direct contact. Um, so when I was beekeeping with grandpa, he would show me how bees made sacrifices for the colony. And I witnessed the um, maternal bond between the queen and her worker bee daughters. So grandpa taught me that the queen is the only bee in the hive that can lay eggs, but she can't feed herself or keep warm at night without the protection and help of her daughters. Um, so the red dot you see is a, is a little dab of paint. Um, there are these paint pens where you can mark your queen. Um, it helps you find her more easily. So grandpa, um, and his bees modeled the generosity and the love and the loyalty that was missing from my life. And slowly over time, I learned how to trust again. And the title of the book comes from an old World War II army bus that was marooned in grandpa's backyard. Um, he'd torn out all the seats and built a honey factory inside. And he got it, and he built this factory out of old spare junk he had in the yard. Um, and he got it from a friend in Big Sur who purchased it at auction at the Fort Ord military base. Um, and at first grandpa drove it to his hives so that he could extract the honey right on the spot. But very quickly he figured out it's ridiculous to try to get this thing up um, the narrow dirt roads and it took a lot of gas and um, there was annual registration. So it just became too much money. So he parked it here to my grandmother's great chagrin and I put a little Where's Waldo arrow to help you find it. And here's a closer view. And that's where it sat for the next 60 years. <laughs> he removed the engine and sold it to a friend for his truck. And here's, um, here's what it looked like inside. Um, as you can see, it's very DIY and not OSHA approved. Um, the, Metal cans in the corner stacked up. Those are old Wesson oil cans that he would fill with honey for customers. And this was the spinner uh, where we would put the wooden frames of honeycomb and spin it to get the honey out. And here he's using a hot knife to slice open the honeycomb uh, before it goes in the spinner. The bees put a thin, um, thin seal of wax over the honeycomb to keep the honey in. So you have to cut it off. And that um, hot knife, he heated up. You see there's a hose that's kind of attached to the handle. Well, the other end of the hose went through a hole in the bus and it was somehow attached to a tea kettle on top of a propane tank. Um, and you know, you're lucky he's wearing pants. I had to um, sift through my photos to get some G rated ones because it got so hot in the bus we had to keep all the windows and doors closed so the bees wouldn't come in while we were extracting. And he, he liked to extract on the hottest days of the year because the honey was runnier. 
So he'd often strip down to his BVDs and his kids and that was it. So um, I caught, I got him in his Levi's, thank goodness. And then there was a pump at the bottom of the spinner that sent it up through a network of galvanized steel plumbing pipes that he'd um, suspended in place with uh, fishing wire. You can see the wire a little better there. And the honey emptied in a stream over a 50 gallon holding tank that had cheesecloth stretched over the top. Um, and that was the filtration system. And then the whole thing was, um, excuse me, the whole thing was powered by an engine he'd lift, ripped out of a lawnmower. And then every summer we harvested honey inside. And we were working, but also the honey bus doubled as my confessional. It was the one place where I could talk about my problems away from the rest of the world. And there was one person in my life who would listen. And grandpa counseled me, but um, he didn't speak to me directly. He spoke to me in bee metaphors. He told me stories about bees and how they handle problems. So I remember we talked a lot about the scout bee. So I'm sure you've heard that bees dance to communicate, right? Well, um, scout bees are the ones who find the flowers and then they come back to the hive and dance to let the other bees know where the flowers are. And if you've never seen this, it's pretty amazing. And I actually did catch it on video in my own hives. So I'm gonna show you real quick what bee dancing looks like. Um, and the, you'll see which bee is dancing because she's moving like crazy, but she has two little yellow balls. So you'll notice on her back legs and that's pollen. So she's come back to the hive and she's like, hey, look what I got, everybody. Check it out, check it out, check it out. So um, you'll spot her doing that. So here we go. Okay, go. So uh, I made these little videos uh, to promote my book when it came out, and that was one of them. I was having fun with that. Um, so scalpies, they search for flowers, but they also look for new homes when there's something wrong with the place the colony is currently living. It's either too drafty, too vulnerable to predators, or too um, overcrowded. So um, they'll dance, to, they'll, they'll go out and scout other locations, and then they come back and dance to um, advertise the address of the new home they found. And then I don't know, the bees have a meeting or something, but they all decide a certain day, a certain time, they're gonna relocate. And that's when you see one of these. That's when you see a swarm in the air. And I don't know if you've ever seen this, but it's pretty biblical. It's like a roar in the sky coming out. So I realize now what grandpa was uh, trying to say to me is that maybe the home I had wasn't the best one but there was another home out there waiting for me if I took the initiative to go out and find it. So he was giving a lonely girl a concept of the future and he was also giving me uh, hope. And so the last thing I wanna do is, um, I'd like to end with grandpa in his own words. So I have um, a short three minute video I took of him 10 years ago at our house in Carl Valley. Um, and apologies in advance, it's handheld and there's some shaky parts, but um, I think it captures his spirit and um, it's what I'd like to leave you with today. You don't handle them in a jerky motion or anything. So let me ask you what, why you like beekeeping? What's well, it's interesting. Yeah. It's just interesting. It's a good outlet. It's nice and quiet. Nobody bothers me. And I do like to sell the honey because people really appreciate it. Yeah, there's a nice, there's a new one. Oh, let's see. Oh, yeah. I hold up to the line. Mm -hmm. Customers uh, are 
special customers that uh, runs the pump down here. This is a pump. And the pump pumps up to, to, to a filter. Oh. And I, I have a, I have a cheesecloth for the honey to come up through and that way I get rid of all the stray bee parts, <laughs> pieces of wax or whatever might be in it. It comes out clean out the bottom. We leave it uh, set for a, a few days and all of the air bubbles go out. And to take care of a, a sting like that, Meredith. You go like that. And you scrape it sideways. Yeah, because if you get it that way, you squeeze all the venom in. in. Like a syringe, you'll just. Yeah, if I went and grabbed it like that, it squeeze it. You know. It just... I'm hearing good news that the bees are starting to come back. Well, they're learning more about them and they, uh, about what's wrong, and I think they're just stressed. Mm. A lot of it is stress because they move them all over, and they just really works the bees and moving them like that doesn't do them any good like my bees i never have had hive die off because of anything like that because i'm not moving my bees but, uh, now that bee that's buzzing around you right now is that like a guard bee that yeah. comes all the way from the hive to yeah. like the one that's buzzing around me now yeah okay you can hear it Woo! I think come. time to leave okay so that was the end of uh, my presentation and I hope you really enjoyed it and I hope uh, I have... there okay I stopped sharing my screen and I'm back did it so thank you I I, um, I just I think grandpa would have been so tickled uh, to be on the cover of a book he would have thought it was a little silly but um, you know, I think that there are walking Buddhas amongst us and they're very rare people and they're very humble and you would never know who they are. Um, and I think he was one of them and I was just so, so, so lucky to stumble across his path because really kids like me, they just need one person to reach their hand out, just one. And you know, it doesn't even have to be someone who's related to you. Um, it actually doesn't even have to be human, it can be a dog. Um, but some, someone has to make you their everything for you to get through um, what I got through. Thank you so much, Meredith, for showing those uh, incredible slides. It's, um, you know, I think we all feel connected to your story uh, just based on geography, but to be able to see your grandpa's smiling face and actually hear from him directly is really special. So thank you for, uh, for, for sharing that with us. We're gonna split uh, into breakout rooms now, uh, smaller groups so that we can discuss the book. Uh, Zoom is going to automatically place you into a room uh, and it may take a few minutes for us to get this, uh, to make this happen. But once you join your breakout room, uh, we'll have a staff, a Big Sur Land Trust person there to help facilitate a discussion with a couple of questions uh, for the group. Uh, and after about 25 minutes or so, we'll bring everyone back uh, to have a conversation um, with Meredith and, um, and ask questions. So we're gonna um, hold tight while we break you up into groups. You know, I hope that you all enjoyed um, the small groups discussion. It sounds like you did, so that's great. And now um, we're gonna have an opportunity to ask uh, Meredith some questions. And I know I saw some in the chat, so we've captured a bunch of them. Um, and so again, if anyone wants to submit a question, you can certainly do that um, into the chat. You can send it to everyone or you can send it directly to Ashley. She's one of our um, co-hosts. And then if you have questions that you wanna ask Jeanette, our, our president and CEO, or any of the other staff members, um, you're welcome to submit those questions as well. Um, and so we'll try to spend the last few minutes that we have together. We have about another um, 25, 30 minutes where we can um, ask questions. And so the one question that I, I do see frequently is, and I should make sure- Matthew? Matthew? Sorry? What happened to Matthew? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I laugh because that is the number one question. And so I sort of made a joke about it um, because that's my bad. I, I should obviously have put something more in the epilogue explaining my um, dear brother. So um, he is doing great. Uh, he lives in San Mateo. Oh, he yes. and I are really good friends. We talk all the time. Um, he works for Apple, 
So that's kind of like the CIA. I don't really know what he does and he can't tell me, but he tells me when to hold off and on buying a new Apple product. And he's also my IT guy. If anything goes wrong, he can somehow take control of my screen from wherever he is and fix it. So, uh, no, he's great. He's married. Um, also does not have kids, which I don't think is um, a coincidence. Um, and he's a great photographer. For a while, he had his own business um, shooting destination weddings, like these big production weddings in India and China. And for a while there, he was the wedding photographer represented by um, SanDisk, when all our cameras had disks in them. Uh -huh. um, and um, he's doing great. He's, we're very different. Um, he is extremely private. He will not even use Google. Um, and then I, you know, tell everybody everything. So it's been a little squeamy for him um, to have me put him in the book and put it out on Main Street. Um, but he read a copy before I turned it into my editor. Just, I wanted to make sure that um, nothing bothered him and that he felt I portrayed him accurately. And he was very helpful, um, corrected me on some stuff about airplanes and cars that I got wrong. And, um, you know, he, he says that, you know, it's, it's th sort of the reaction to him when the book came out is that a lot of his coworkers started inviting him to lunch and then um, wanting to ask him a bunch of questions and make sure he was okay. <laughs> um, he, you know, it makes him feel a little weird, but I think deep down he kind of likes it. He likes that knowing that people care, um, but he's, he's very proud and he's been to a lot of um, events and we had a big book party at Nepenthe um, restaurant on the Big Sur coast. We had a belly dancer because my grandpa always liked the belly dancers there. And um, he came and I mean, he's, he's, he's been having a, a really good time with this, but he um, would prefer if nobody recognized him. Or, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Well, that's nice to hear that he's doing well. Yeah. That's great. And so then there was another question here from Will. Um, what happened with Sophia and um, Dominique? They seemed to be such a positive influence on, mm -hmm. your, ad our, on your adolescence. Yeah, so, um, Sophia became an accountant. Um, she also lives like on the peninsula somewhere. Um, she and I didn't stay in real good contact, but good enough that, you know, we see each other like once every three or five years or so at a, a, a party or um, a gathering. Uh, she got married and had three boys. Um, and, oh, and Dominique, um, came to one of my events in um, a winery in Carmel Valley and surprised me, just walked in. And she, dang, if she doesn't still look like Pat Benatar, it, she's just, she walks into a room and everyone goes, oh. you know, it was just amazing to see her. So I had not seen her or been in contact with Dominique in a while. Although, um, again, I gave Sophia and Dominique um, the pages that they were in and had them read them. Uh, before it went in. I think it's, it's only fair. I mean, even if it's really flattering, um, people need to know what's coming out and what's going to be said about them. And they need the chance to say, mm, I never wore a gold lame jumpsuit, which, um, which uh, Dominique said, but allowed me to keep it in because she thought it was funny. So yeah. we have it. that's great. Um, so then, you know, the, this is sort of the theme of the, the relationships that you had. Um, and so one of the questions that came from Becky is, what was your grandfather's relationship with your mother like? Mm. Um, he avoided her. Um, he, uh, he did not approve of her neglect, but he was very very good at keeping it inside and not confronting her. Um, but he would let like little things slip in the bus, like, Oh, your mother. And, you know, and he would say, you know, you know how she is. And just, he would tell me to sort of not provoke her or stay out of her way. I mean, he was sort of guiding me, I guess, to behave around her the way he did. 
Um, but he, yeah, he was, he was just flummoxed, like why she um, didn't choose to participate. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, toward the end of his life, um, my mom was just really nasty and would say mean things about him and, and make fun of him when he would, you know, lose his, he was, um, you know, when he would stumble and she was just a really cruel, cruel person, you know, because a lot of the things she had in life were because of him and his work and his income, but she just, Ooh, next question, please. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So then, um, there is a question here actually um, from Susan and it's, if you could add anything that you left out of the book, what would you add now? Um, more about my brother. <laughs> um, wow. Uh, I have to think about that because, you know, it took me 10 years to write and I rewrote it three times. And I had so many scenes I took in, left out, took in, left out, that I really feel that the final version was exactly what I wanted it to be. So I don't, um, I don't have a moment where I, I thought, oh, I should have put that in, except for an update on my brother, really. Yeah, great. And so then um, there's a question here about, um, from Nikki is, what old Big Sur family was your um, grandfather a member of? The Posts. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, the way it goes is uh, William Brainerd Post, uh, in the 1800s, came to Monterey from New England, and he uh, worked as a whaler. He was a teenager, 18 or 19. He just wanted to get away from his family and um, fell in love with uh, a native woman, an Ohlone woman named Anselma Onisimo. And they together started the Post Ranch. And so they had cattle, um, they had beehives, I have my grandfather or actually my great grandmother's photo albums. And so I I have a lot of old pictures. And when I saw beehives at the post ranch, I freaked out because then I realized, oh, wait, I'm fifth generation, at least that I know of. But um, they would, uh, Anselma would cook these huge dinners for people and they'd go on packing trips on donkeys and horses up into the coast. And um, so Anselma and William, had a baby named Ellen and that baby Ellen had another daughter and named her Ellen and that second Ellen was grandpa's mom and I actually knew her for about 15 years Um, she died in 1985 but she lived in Pacific Grove and um, that's where grandpa grew up but he spent every day after school and his summers um, down in Big Sur learning how to rope cattle and build fences with the trotters. Um, and yeah, that's how that all works. So um, that fancy schmancy post ranch now is um, named after grandpa's family. And uh, each, each room at the post ranch, the, you know, those rooms that cost several thousand a night <laughs> are named after pioneering families in Big Sur. And one of them is the Ellen Peace Room. And there's a picture of my grandma on the wall in there. Yeah. Or my great grandma. Yeah. So um, I'm selfishly going to ask my question. So I have an eight-year-old boy who got stung about two weeks ago, and now he's terrified of bees. And so um, just wondering what any advice that you might give for, um, you know, young kids who do have that fear. Because I, I loved the part of the, the story where you talked about you're at the table and he put the bee in the glass and, you, you know, worked through that fear with you. And so just wondering. Mm-hmm. That. Um, well, I would uh, tell, well, if two things, I, I would talk to him about bees and explain why they sting and they only do it they don't want to, uh, because if they do, they die. And they only do it if by accident you um, step on them or sit on them or, or handle them or scare them. And um, 
you know what I'd also do is maybe if you know a beekeeper, some get him suited up so he's protected and have him go watch the bees close that way. Mm -hmm. That's probably what I would do. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so when bees are transported to say almond or orchards to pollinate, what happens after the process is, is done? Are they uh, rotated to another crop? What are the negative impacts to the hive or to the uh, large honeybee population? Oh, okay, here I go. <laughs> Soapbox. Um, large commercial beekeepers who um, have bees for pollination uh, instead of honey, the money's in pollination, so there's no point in um, extracting honey. Uh, they have thousands and thousands of hives and they follow the bloom around the country. So they start as early as they can, say February, and they're you know in the, I don't know, blueberry fields in Maine, or I may be getting my seasons and fruits wrong, but basically they start with the earliest bloom and then they make their way around the country following whatever blooms next. Um, almonds in California are the biggest uh, crop that large commercial beekeepers um, work with, but basically bees are on the road on a truck like that from February through maybe August, um, maybe a couple of months at a stop. So there is a statistic that in the U.S. more bees live on trucks than live um, in hives, like in nature, in natural hives that don't move or trees, um, which is really w sad to me. Um, and this is what my grandfather was saying, is that it is completely stressful for bees to move them like that, you know, to use them as forced labor, because each time you relocate a hive, it has to reorient, it has to figure out what the landmarks are, it has to figure out where the food is, and then it has to start collecting it. And then when you disrupt it and move it again, you start the process over. Um, and so it's, it's difficult um, for honeybees to live that way. Um, and, you know, I think it's one of many factors that weakens a bee's immune system, because we're bringing them to crops that have been sprayed with herbicide and pesticide. So, you know, they are ingesting micro traces of this and um, it might not kill them exact, you know, immediately, but they're bringing that um, chemical into the architecture of their hive. It gets absorbed into the wax. It's like living in a lead-based paint home. Like over time, it'll eventually get you or it'll get your kids. And um, so, uh, those are all reasons why it's very hard uh, on the bees. And, you know, I'm a big advocate of figuring out a way to have the bees on, to, instead of move the bees to the fields, have them there permanently or have, you know, I don't understand why we're moving them. It's expensive and um, a lot of gas. It seems that if the farmers could purchase bees full time and then hire the beekeeper to come tend it, just the, make the humans move and not the bees. Um, you know, the hives would have to be moved when, when the farmers spray, obviously, but they don't have to be moved to another state. They could be moved. I mean, we could build like, I don't know, safe houses for them or something. There just needs to be some wild creativity around this issue because, you know, we have to eat but there's got to be a way we can eat that's more harmonious to the pollinators. Mm. Thank you. That was, that's helpful. Um, so then here, um, Alexa is asking, um, notice a lack of literature of this type when memoir storytelling related to wilderness wildlife conservation. These formats are so powerful because they elicit an emotional response from the reader. How do we find more like this or how can we push to get more of these types of stories published? Oh, um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head of, of some books like this. Um, and I think there, there are actually, I think there, 
there's kind of a, a wave of popularity of these kind of books right now. And one I'm thinking of is Soul of an Octopus is amazing. Um, the Sound of a Wild Snail Eating is, is amazing. Um, you know, I read a bunch of these while I was writing the book, but I was writing it uh, three years ago now, so I'm a little dusty. But, um, you know, it's kind of funny in some bookstores, they, you'll find my book in the nature section and then some in the memoir section and then some in beekeeping section. I think for this very reason, like it's kind of undefinable, which is one of the reasons that I was a little bit worried that the book might not catch on because it's, it's kind of its own well, animal. Um, but there are, oh, Wesley the Owl is a good one. Um, oh, uh, if, uh, what is her name? Um, Mama's Last Hug is a good one. Um, That's great. Temple Grandin, anything by Temple Grandin is really good. Um, and those are just some off the top of my head, but if you poke around, you can find them. And I think they're becoming more and more popular. Wonderful, thank you. So then we have a question from Jim. Have you been bowling since that awful day? The reader suffered many emotions after this anger, frustration, pity. Oh, I didn't hear a question in there. I, oh, have you been bowling? Have, have you been able to, you know, reconnect to that uh, experience? Have I been crying since I wrote my book? No, no, bowling. Bowling? The game, bowling. Oh, oh, <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, I love bowling. Um, <laughs> because that was really painful as a reader to, to, to be that. In I know. Part of yeah, I, I probably, I'm not even sure if um, that bowling alley still exists. I think it was in Salinas, yeah. Um, and I think it's gone. I probably wouldn't choose that bowling alley to go back to. Um, but um, yeah, there's like disco bowling now too. That's really cool. They mm -hmm. do like the dark lights and the, um, what is that? Black lights and the, and the disco, sorry. Um, I used to live in Daly City, and uh, they had lots of bowling alleys there. It's super fun. Good. Yeah, I mean, I get the point of the question is basically, um, you know, am I able to kind of go back through my childhood haunts and, you know, keep it together? And um, yeah, I've moved back to Carmel Valley. I moved here uh, about a year ago. And um, I think that's good for me because, yeah, you know, I go by that house I grew up in every once in a while and take a look at it. It's being completely remodeled. But um, I think writing the book quite literally is like putting my childhood on a shelf and I can let it be there. I don't have to carry it inside. And, um, you know, each time someone tells me I enjoyed your book, it's like, it's like I was carrying this big bag of sand and it was really heavy and I had to keep it quiet and not bring it out in polite company. And um, each time someone says, yeah, me too, uh, they take one of those grains of sand, you know, and my burden is getting lighter and lighter and lighter. So um, I, I feel like really happy here in Carmel Valley and seeing some of the things I used to see and I talked to the, I went to the, my elementary school and did a presentation on bees and it's just, it's full circle now. But I think that if I had not written the book and then came home, it would have been more itchy. More painful. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that so generously. Um, so how, this is from Terry. How do you know when the book, how did you know when the book was ready to go out into the world? Um, well, my editor told me, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's actually, um, oh, okay, wait, I'm being too literal. The question means, how did I know when it was time to start writing it? Not how did I know when it was finished? Or, you know, how, how did I know I was ready to start? Um, well, this is a really funny 
answer because it's it's not like a deep answer you would expect. I um, enrolled in an MFA, MFA program while I was still working at the Chronicle and it's a low residency program, which means that you don't have to be on campus full time for two years. You're there for two weeks in the summer and um, the rest of the time you do correspondence with your professor. And this is um, Goucher College in Maryland. And I went because I wanted a, a MFA. And I thought, um, I thought I was very smart because I had written a story for the Chronicle that got some attention. And I had an agent in New York who was like, yeah, we can sell this. And part of the MFA program requirements was that you graduate with 150 pages written. And I thought, aren't I brilliant? I'm going to go to this MFA program, I'm going to get my MFA, and I'm going to use it to get going on this book, which is surely going to sell. And I just didn't know anything at the time about how books get made and stuff, but I was convinced. And then the day I showed up, I got the call that it wasn't going to happen. And I went to my first class and the professor said, okay, come back to the next class. We're going to workshop, bring pages, we're going to workshop. And I'd never heard workshop used as a verb. And I had to ask one of the students who was a New York Times bestseller, what, what's workshop? And he said, you bring pages and we all read it and talk to you about it. Um, pages, okay. So I went back to my dorm room, opened my computer and I wrote, I didn't see who threw it. And it was about the pepper grinder and my parents. Fight. And I just wrote that first scene of this big fight in Rhode Island and uh, came back to class with it because I needed something. So that's actually how it started. I mean, my friends had been telling me a lot all along, you should write a book, you should write a book, but it came out of um, like desperation. Yeah, it had nothing to do with feeling the need to write it, but um, you know, over time it, it became real. Yeah, that's a great segue into, there was another question here and it's similar to where you were going with that. And I don't know if you would elaborate or not, but um, in the in the book, you didn't talk much about your school schoolwork, but mentioned getting into college. And so the question is, can you discuss a bit about your development as a writer? So you gave us a little bit of previews. That is, is there anything else you would mm -hmm. add to that? Um, yes, uh, I I think. Um, well, I always wanted to be a journalist because I didn't quite get that um, I could, I thought that that's the only way a writer could make money. <laughs> As the only um, idea in my head of a working writer was a journalist. And so, um, and then I went to Mills College, which didn't have a journalism degree. So <laughs> there you go. Um, but Mills College is really um, open-minded and creative and they let you design your own major. And, you know, I worked for the school paper and did a lot of internships at um, newspapers and TV stations and just was sort of absorbing how other people create stories. And um, when I graduated without a job, I uh, freelanced for small little papers and weeklies and whoever would pay me by the story. And I lived in a basement apartment in Berkeley with a roommate. Um, and when I finally got a job at the Chronicle, um, I was a feature writer and I was always writing too long. My editors would complain because my stories came in at like 40 and 50 inches when they're supposed to be 15. And um, so I think I was just in the wrong uh, position, but the Chronicle was like my MFA program and I didn't even realize it because um, I had some wonderful editors there. Uh, one in particular, David Lewis was a screenwriter, but he, um, they would allow me to do these very long stories that would be serials and would run over three or four or five days. And, you know, I travel to different countries to write these amazing stories of, uh, or write these stories of amazing people. And, um, they really indulged me and David sat down with me for six months and ripped apart my work and showed me how to um, write a story that has three acts and a, and a narrative arc and tension and characters. And so everything he taught me, I um, pulled into 
book writing. And in fact, he, um, he edited some very early drafts of the honey bus, you know, until finally I got on my feet and I was able to do it on my own. But that, that was, um, there were so many people who were so generous to me with their time and, uh, really sort of cobbled together my own school because I didn't, I didn't have, um, I didn't major in writing. So I had to just kind of go by feel and figure it out. Yeah. So I think, um, connected to, um, sort of the, the approach you took to writing the book and, you know, you talked about the arc and different characters. There's a question here from Lisa about, um, in the book, I felt like it took some time before you revealed that your grandmother had been in a, an abusive relationship and your mother, mm-hmm. grandmother and mother had been in an abusive relationship. This added momentum and kept me reading. Was that an intentional in how you outlined the book? Yes, eventually, you know, like I said, I wrote it three times and, you know, the first version was a very um, self-therapeutic wounded version um, that really is only interesting to me. And in that version, I didn't even have their backstories. I mean, I was just so mad and I wanted you to just be mad with me, right? Um, I th- then when I got to the... Um, the third version. And, and I realized, you know, I had to mature as a daughter actually to write this book correctly and have some, I don't have to have sympathy, but I have to have some understanding of the era and the time my mom grew up in and, and her weakness. Um, and I don't, so yes, I didn't want to put that all up front because then you'd know why um, my mother and my grandmother were behaving the way they were. And it, there would be no, um, well, it's called a through line, right? There'd be no through line, this question you're needing answered to keep you going. So yeah, so, you know, writers are manipulative. You know, we have to be like, so are movie makers. We we have to know everything before you do, but make you figure it out um, in a way that makes you feel like you're figuring it out, not like I'm manipulating you. So um, it worked for some people, it did it for others. But I think, yeah, I mean, to do justice to both my mother and my grandmother who suffered a lot as as women, um, their stories definitely need to be in there. And then the reader can decide whether or not they should be forgiven. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't have to decide that because on every given day, I feel different about it. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. So yeah. So you mentioned um, movie makers. There's a question from Barbara. Has there been any interest or any um, in a screenplay? Um, There has been a lot of dating and a lot of flattery. Um, But what, you know, my experience with Hollywood and producers is that um, there's, they love, 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 love you. But you really don't take anything personally until you sign something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's been a lot of dates, but like no commitments. Yeah. First dates are hard too. (laughs) Hard. So um, this is a question from Catherine. So reading your book was so relatable as I grew up with a a family member with mental illness. As I read your perspective, of your childhood, there were so many times where I was like, that happened to me, Um, such as uh, me wanting friends to come over, families, members died, et cetera. And so it took me years of therapy to understand what was going on because nobody in my small town ever discussed mental illness. And in 1992 to 2010, only 10 years ago, um, would be considered my childhood. So not that far um, Um long ago. So what is your perspective on the trajectory of mental illness from your childhood experience to now? Um, I think back in the seventies, we didn't have a lot of the terms that we have now for uh, a lot of the disorders and post-traumatic stress wasn't a term. And we also didn't have a lot of sympathy for women. They were hysterical if they were emotional about stuff. But no, they were hysterical because they weren't being listened to and, and taken seriously. And I think, um, I think we've come a long way in um, both um, 
you know, equal rights, and we've come a long way in um, therapy and, and understanding what's abnormal behavior. Um, and the, the sort of the shame of it, I think, it, you know, I'm not going to say it's gone, but I, I think when um, people talk openly about what's going on in their families, which is much more common now, then you can see patterns and you can go, okay, wait a minute, this is probably you know, bipolar, or this is probably um, personality disorder, or this is narcissism, or this is toxic narcissism. I mean, we, we, can, we have language to talk about what we're seeing, whereas before it was like, oh, that's just Sally, or oh, that's just my mom, or, you know, we didn't know. Um, so I think things are better, but I also think there's a lot of um, family secrecy which is an, an, another theme in my book. Um, and, you know, once I wrote it, once I turned it in, once it was done editing and my editor said, okay, we're going to put it through the machine now, whatever, it makes a book. That's when I freaked out. I was just so concerned about, does the writing work? Is it clear? Is the story interesting? And then I thought, oh God, like, what did I do? Which sounds really dumb because you're writing a memoir, but I just wasn't sure um, if this was really going to happen. So I was just really focused on the writing. And then I worried a little bit, but um, now having gone through, you know, a year plus of meeting people and talking about the book and uh, so many me too conversations, I realized, okay, you know, that was the right thing to do. And hopefully it will inspire other people to talk about it. And um, I'm thinking of a story real quick. Um, the Daily Mail in London asked me to write a story about um, toxic motherhood. And uh, I did. And then when the article came out online, it said something like, woman who hates her mother um, says why or something like that. And I went ballistic, you know, and I called my agent and I got, you know, that change to like a woman who doesn't love her mother. And I was like, okay, that's probably true. But hate is active. And, um, you know, I, I pity my mother. I wish that she had taken the chance to uh, be my friend, be my brother's friend. I mean, we could have pulled her out of this. Um, but I think it's also important to talk about that honestly. I mean, there's this culture of you cannot speak um, negatively about your parents, even if um, they don't love you. And, and you should be able to say that they don't and, and free up other people to say me too about that. I think that's a huge shameful thing, but um, uh I am okay with saying it because it's true. And I, uh, actually, I said, parents, I have a good relationship with my father. I don't want him to get swept up in this. I'm just talking about my mom. Yeah. So that actually, the, there's two um, questions that did come with just how you ended. One was, was your mother ever diagnosed? And the other was, what is your relationship with your father? Had you ever been able to, um, you know, connect with him again? Um, mother, no, never diagnosed. Um, she and my grandmother never thought there was a problem. So that's the end of that. Um, and uh, my father and I have actually become closer. Um, he was very helpful in helping me remember the early periods in Rhode Island. I would have fuzzy memories. I could remember like the print on the wallpaper. I could remember the yelling, but I didn't know what it was about. So um, I interviewed him and it was difficult for him. He could only this was over, we would interview over Facebook messenger chat like that, that he could handle and only for about 15 minutes. And then I'd have to shut it down and come back at him again. Cause he just really didn't want to go there, but it was really good. Um, he sort of deepened my own story of what happened because I grew up with my grandmother, and my mom, just bad mouthing him. So I, I, you know, as a little kid, I was actually afraid of him. Um, so it was really good to see his side. And um, I also gave him a copy to read before I turned it in. And his only comment was, you know, that cat that you mentioned, he had a cat named Fatso. 
it's really inappropriate, but that's my dad. Um, he said, we didn't have that cat when you visited that one time. And I said, oh, okay, I'll take the cat out. And he said, no, I'll leave it in. And so like, we have a little joke in there um, about the cat, but um, he's really proud of me. He's um, come to some of my events. Uh, you know, he's, he's in the audience and I, I say, we have a special guest. I make my dad stand up. He loves it. Um, I think he's, you know, he always says he wishes he could have spent more time in California with us. And, you know, it's given me the chance to say, you know, dad, you were 20 something, you know, and, and it's like, we bond because in a way we both divorced the same woman. Right. So um, it's hard for him. It's difficult, but it's, it's, I'm helping him also put it on the shelf too. So it's, it's been really good. And he remarried and had um, two sons and uh, they, they read it and their wives read it. And so it has this interesting thing where like, relatives of my family who know me sort of um, are, are getting the whole backstory. Like they didn't know the story of dad's first family. So it's, it's really kind of pulled the family together. And now we talk about this stuff. Like we didn't talk about it before. So um, thank you so much. We have, uh, I've got quite a few questions here that I, um, we're not gonna have time to get to, but I just wanna sort of leave with one question that brings us um, back to the bees. Cause there were a couple folks that said, um, you know, questions about your beekeeping in San Francisco compared to Carmel Valley, you know, how, how was that experience for you? And then there's a question about, um, you know, bees withstanding hot temperatures. Um, how do bees do in an urban setting, you know, as far as San Francisco? So I think there's some interest in that sort of um, beekeeping in, in a city setting versus Carmel Valley. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, here we know we had the fires, the Sobranes fire um, being the most recent. Uh, well, actually, there's a couple others, but just thinking about how um, in one of the slides that you had in the start, uh, where areas where some of the fires had come through and so how that might have impact bees. So sort of. I'll see if I can take these in order quickly. Uh, temperatures in the hive. Um, bees maintain a constant temperature of about 95 degrees, and they do that either by fanning their wings when it's too hot to do air conditioning, or they huddle together um, to keep warm. So you can put a beehive in North Dakota, you can put one in Big Sur, and it's gonna be the same temperature, pretty much. Um, city beekeeping uh, is actually easier than country beekeeping, and it doesn't um, make sense on the surface, but um, in a city, you have so many people who have um, imported plants from all over, and so you have stuff that blooms year round because it's all on a different schedule. And also there's a lot of water that's collected in gutters and a lot of people are um, watering their lawns. So actually um, urban bees have an easier time of it. Like think of it as like a cruise ship buffet. They just go out and there's, there's something everywhere. Whereas in the city, excuse me, the country you have the bloom, like the buckwheat now, or all the, um, you know, pittosporum is going now or whatever, and the, all the bees have to get there and get it, and then it's gone. So um, there's, you out here in the country, you have to deal with that, and it's called, um, you know, dearth. And so there's a lot more, uh, you feed them a lot more sugar water out here and earlier in the season. Um, and, uh, so that's what's different. Um, also, I would say uh, it's it's a little easier to beekeep. Well, what I'm saying is I, I have two hives now and I, it's, I will I still need to see how they're going to do. They're very new, but um, I think that they're going to be healthier because they're native to this area. They've learned how to adapt. In the city, you have to buy bees from wherever and, and bring them in. And um, especially if you buy them from uh, a larger company that raises queens or bees or whatnot, um, it's harder for them to adapt to a different place. And then also there's just more likelihood of um, viruses and diseases because you're buying them from a place that has lots of bees uh, around. So 
I think I'm predicting I'm going to have less of a problem with um, mites um, because, and I'm kind of geeking out here, but one of the colonies I bought from uh, a guy in Big Sur who was mentored by my grandpa, I actually met him on the side of the road where we spread grandpa's ashes and he put it, the bees from the back of his truck into my truck. But he raises um, hygienic bees, which is uh, the, they're these bees. I mean, they have entomologists who are breeding queen bees for traits that um, her offspring have and hygienic bees pull the mites off of the other bees. Um, and they're very fastidious and tidy. And that's like all the rage in beekeeping now. So this is my first experience with a hygienic colony. And I want to see if um, I get better results. Right. Yeah. Was that, yeah. did I hit all the questions? Yeah. Thank you so much. You are um, just a gift. We, I think, really enjoyed getting to ask you questions and obviously really enjoyed the book. I see lots of people clapping. So I just want to thank you for so generously answering our questions and spending time with us. And I'm going to turn it over to Jeanette to close us out. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you so much, Meredith. For uh, Thanks, everyone, for taking the time to be with us and um, spend time thinking about this uh, book and um, relationships to nature. And uh, it's just been a really fun evening. So I, I hope you all enjoyed yourselves. I wanted to just um, close with a quote. So uh, this was, uh, there were so many um, pieces and uh, you know, so many different sentences that I had pulled out and, and written these little notes in this notebook that I keep of uh, really these small gifts that I'll go back and reread um, little excerpts from things that I've read. And uh, I found this, I, I really loved this statement. So I wanna close with this piece from Meredith's book. And, um, and that is, uh, Bees live for a purpose far grander than themselves. Each of their small contributions combining to create collective strength rather than withdrawing from the daunting task of living, honeybees make themselves essential through their generosity. By giving more than they took, bees ensured their survival and reached what might be considered a state of grace. And I just, uh, I really loved that. And I, I want to thank you, Meredith, for your generosity. I think you've, um, you know, this, sharing this incredible story of your relationship with your grandfather and your relationship with bees. I think we're all left uh, feeling uh, like our, our lives are a bit richer. So thank you. <laughs> thank you.